Cheers, everyone. Happy Friday, and welcome to another episode of Wine and Weeds. I'm very boring today. This is my go-to. It is Barefoot Cabernet. What can I say? It is fast and easy, and it makes weeding that much easier. Um, Erin has all the fun drinks, so I can't wait to see what she has. So that's it for this. What can I say? Um, totally boring. <laughs> so let's get to the weeds. Nice breeze right now. I'm kind of running in and out between the raindrops, and I think that Erin is as well, the last I talked to her. So yeah, it feels so good right now. It's been brutally hot. You may have noticed a new scene behind me, and yes, I did stand here on purpose. <laughs> the greenhouse is up, you guys. I am super, super excited. I love how it turned out. Mark and I worked so incredibly hard to put this up this year, and it is finally done. Can't wait to share it with you guys. I'll do a full tour and talk to you guys all about that within the week. But I do have to blame this guy for my garden neglect. <laughs> I have to blame someone, so I'm going to blame the greenhouse. It's August, so what does that mean? It means crabgrass. I've got crabgrass everywhere. Usually the crabgrass is just in the lawn, but this year I really let this bed over here go, and this year I just let it go, go off the rails. Um, so as you can see, it's even gone to seed, which basically lets me know that next year I'm gonna be having this problem too. This much of a state, you know, it really is not fun to do. Not that weeding is ever fun to do, but. And it filled completely with crabgrass. Um, I just couldn't keep up with it. And since I'm re-landscaping this area and kind of doing a whole new scheme in the fall, I'm gonna be replanting all new shrubs and plants and perennials, I figured I might as well just let it go. And that's what I did. So last week I came out here, got down on my hands and knees and just pulled out every last bit of the crabgrass and put it into huge piles. I can't really, I really can't believe how much was there. Um, so what's the good things about crabgrass? Are there any? Well, it's green, so that's a plus. Uh, would look great in these brown spots that are in my lawn. <laughs> Anything would be better than brown. As long as it's not brown, that's okay with me. So it's green. Uh, it's an annual. That's the best part of crabgrass. It's gonna die when your other annuals die and it's not gonna come back again. However, if you let it go to seed, it's going to germinate new seedlings, new crabgrass next year. It's good that it doesn't have tap roots or rhizomes or anything like that that makes it a real bugger to pull. So it does pull out quite easily. Hence the name crabgrass. It grows out laterally like this along your lawn. And those tendrils that grow out form new roots. So it really does form like a mat. Um, so when you pull it, just make sure you get it all out. I find that it pulls out pretty easily for me. Um, lawn mowers love to just roll right over it. Lawn mowers don't even really cut the crabgrass. Uh, it does keep it at bay so it's not setting those tall seed heads. So that's a good thing. We want to keep the crabgrass mowed and under control. I don't mind it unless it's in my garden beds or when it starts to creep onto the sidewalk. It looks unruly and just unkempt. So I'll get my weed whacker and I will trim up the edge of the crabgrass. So lawn care is really low, low on my list. It really doesn't even make the cut. So I don't take a lot of time caring for my lawn. So of course I'm seeing the crabgrass and everything in it year after year. I don't do anything to control it. Uh, if I had a whole clover lawn, that would be, make me very happy. It's great for the bunnies. They love it. They stay out of my plants. It's great for the bees. So that's a win-win, but this is a combination of crabgrass and clover over and over crabgrass and clover over and over how can i resist okay you guys know me by now <laughs> so what can you do right now it's august you've got the crabgrass it's a lot it's more than you would be able to pull i like to take just like a big metal rake and in early fall i will rake the heck out of my grass and the crabgrass pulls out so easily you just want to rake it all up get it into piles and then you can reseed I like to use a perennial rye grass seed. It works out really well here in New Jersey Zone 7A, so that's my go-to. But just keep in mind, if you let your crabgrass go to seed, next year what's gonna come up is your perennial rye grass and your crabgrass as well, so that will be in there. 
what can you do in that case? You hate the crabgrass, you don't wanna see any of it. I don't use pesticides at all, so I can't even go into the details on something like that because I just don't, don't do that. I like to use things that are safe for my kids, safe for my dog, safe for the pollinators, safe for the environment in general. So you guys know I love Espoma, and I thought, this is a product I've never used. It's been around, I've never used it. And I looked it up and I thought, I got a really out of control crabgrass problem in my garden beds, what can I use? And I picked this up, actually on Amazon is where I found it. I picked this up on Amazon and this has no chemicals or toxins, safe for kids and pets. I'll be using this in late winter, early spring. It will act as a fertilizer and it will act as a pre-emergent that will get rid of hopefully, I, like I said, I've never used it, a lot of those seedlings from the crabgrass that I neglected and I let go to seed. I'm gonna put that over there in the side border and hopefully my job will be lessened and I won't have as much uh, pulling to do if I use this product. So I'll keep you posted on that and let you know how it goes, but that's what I'm gonna try for this year. That's it, it's not exciting, it's crabgrass, it's August. I've got so many weeds here, you guys, so don't feel bad and don't beat yourselves up. There is no perfect. I've had every single weed that Erin has shared so far, and I'll guarantee you I have the one that she's about to share right now. Erin, let's see what you got, and I can't wait to see what drink you have. Hi, friends. So for today's cocktail, I'm going back to just one of my personal longtime favorite drinks. I don't drink it a lot. In fact, you guys know that I'm really into gin these days. In fact, um, I have quite a few that are on my sort of regular rotation right now. Um, so I drink a lot more gin than I drink anything else. But before there was gin for me, there was rum. Um, now I only like in a, in a sort of a basic mixed drink. There's a couple of exceptions, including the um, daiquiri that I made, which has a white rum in it. But I only like dark rums. And there are only two dark rums that I like. I like Myers. But this is where, this is my go-to. Monke rum has been, Eclipse Barbados rum, has been uh, my rum of choice for decades. So this is the one that's in our, in our house all the time. Now the drink I'm gonna make here is um, sort of my version of a Cuba Libra, which would be just, it's just a rum and coke with a lime with a fancy name. But um, I can't, because rum, is very sweet. Um, I really have to tone down that sweetness in order to like it. So I go for a completely different mixer with my rum drinks. So we'll just get on with it. So obviously you go with your pour of rum into your drink. Maybe that's an ounce, maybe a touch more. And then you're gonna go with um, a tonic. Um, this comes in little cans now. They're just the cutest little cans. I like this light tonic. This is fever tree, but I like the light tonic, especially for these because it's less sugary than the, um, than the regular one. And I'm going to fill that up about, so the glass is about three quarters of the way full. And then the rest of the way we top off with just plain seltzer. Um, because that's really going to cut your sweetness, but you're going to get a lot of fizziness with it. Now, this is a little hard to tell because I have a blue glass. I would say this one's a little light on the rum. Generally speaking, you, I can usually tell how a rum and tonic is mixed um, by the color. So, And then, of course, you absolutely, it is compulsory to top this off with a really big slice of lime with a big squeeze of fresh lime in there. That's a great cocktail. Um, by cutting that sweetness, you actually taste the rum, and uh, which is a good thing. And you get lots of fizzy in there, which is good. So, and um, if you're someone like me who just can't tolerate really sweet alcoholic drinks, this is a great way to enjoy rum without really loading on the sugar that you would get with like a cola or something mixed with it. All right, so cheers. Try that cocktail. Now let's check out this week's weed. Okay, this is serious weed. Today we're taking on Creeping Charlie. So get something to dig with. So 
So Creeping Charlie is not hard to find in my yard, but I did find this nice accessible piece that I thought we'd start with here. So the key is you don't really want to break it off. You can hand pull it to a certain extent, but then you really want to get in there and do your best to try to get the, the roots out. And you might have to go kind of a while because it's also known as ground ivy, which means it travels. Okay, so here's another piece. Okay, so I totally did break that, but sometimes you just can't get it. Okay, so you probably all know Creeping Charlie, right? This is what it looks like. It has these sort of um, ruffled, scalloped leaves on it. This is another one of those plants that was introduced by somebody, I think I read in the 1700s, uh, for a shade ground cover that, of course, um, is not native to this area, took over, and now we all, mostly all of us, deal with this. First of all, I just want to say, this probably should have been my cocktail this week because we are bathing in this stuff because holy mackerel are the mosquitoes, mosquitoes bad. Okay, so here's the thing with Creeping Charlie. So first of all, it can take, it's, you probably have it in, you might have it in your lawn. You can have it in your garden. Um, before I get too far into how to deal with it, I'll just say, you'll probably recognize it actually has a really pretty blue flower in spring. It actually looks a lot like a juga. It's hard to tell a juga flowers and creeping charlie flowers apart at first glance. And they do provide a fairly important source of nectar kind of early on. So once again, this is another thing that has some beneficial aspects to it, but it can take over and it's quite invasive. So what do we do with it? Well. I have a lot of it. First of all, if you have a lot of this, it favors shadier areas that are very moist. Um, a lot of times if you see an area where this is growing, um, like in your lawn, it probably means there's not enough sun for your grass to be growing properly. The other thing is that if you let it go unchecked in your lawn, as we have, um, it will take over the lawn. So one of the things you need to do is try to get it in check. And then if you can get healthy grass growing, then that has a chance to outcompete some of this. But if this is running rampant everywhere, then this is going to outcompete your grass. So that's the issue with that. I don't actually worry about it a lot in my grass. Um, we probably should deal with it at some point, but I don't worry about it a ton. I do worry about it in my garden beds though, because it will get in there and it wreaks havoc in garden beds too. So as you saw, this was growing actually in an area underneath a tree where obviously you don't want weeds competing in that root zone, especially from a new planted tree. So in cases like that, and what I do in my garden is I just hand pull and it's pretty easy to pull out, um, but you do want to try to get the roots, which is, you know, kind of a hairy root thing um i probably didn't get them all in fact i'm sure i didn't but you can do your best to get the roots out um, if you want to do that hand pulling works really well make sure you throw it away somewhere where it won't reroot it'll reroot pretty easily so don't just go throw it you know in the pile of the side of your yard because it'll reroot and then you'll you'll have planted creeping charlie now of course there are other ways to deal with this one of the ways you can do with this if you've got this invading your lawn um, and you just need to start over. One of the ways to deal with it is solarization. And you can do some Google searching on how to properly solarize, but it basically involves clear plastic spread across an area and pinned down for several months. Well, usually it's, I think it's like two months. It all depends. In the heat of summer, you wanna cook that, but it's gonna kill, that kills everything. That kills your grass. So the goal with that is that you're gonna kill everything and then you're gonna replant grass and you're gonna make sure the Creeping Charlie doesn't get in there. So that's one way to do with it. However, broadleaf weed killers will take care of Creeping Charlie if you're comfortable doing something like that. So in terms of chemicals, do some research before you entertain the idea of doing that. But um, the two chemicals that seem to work best on it are ones containing triclopyr, I'm going to put these names on the screen because pronunciation on some of these created chemical names can be hard, or um, glycosphate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. So according to the University of Wisconsin, the way to use chemicals to treat Creeping Charlie is there's a few factors that you want to do. You want to make sure the temperature is between 60 and 80 degrees, there's no chance of rain, and on a not windy day, because what you don't want is chemical drift, which will take out all kinds of things that you don't want it to take out, and that's just bad on so many levels. 
So if you're going to use a chemical, you need to treat it when it's actively growing. So the University of Wisconsin recommends treating this um, in mid to late fall, actually after you have your first frost. Um, and apparently it's particularly effective at this point because this is when um, they're really trying to, it's really trying to draw energy into its roots. So it will more readily absorb that chemical. And then if it's not effective, you can do a second application yet that fall. You can also treat in spring, but the time to do it in spring is when it's actively flowering. And there are issues with doing this when it's actively flowering because of course there are pollinators that are going to be drawn to it during that time. So that's why this fall application um, where it's likely to be less impactful on insects um, is probably a better option. So I'm going to send Laura the link for this article from the University of Wisconsin Extension on how to manage Creeping Charlie. Um, because there's an interesting point in there, which is that they mention in there that borax is often mentioned as an organic method of control for Creeping Charlie. But studies at the University of Wisconsin and the University of Iowa State showed that borax actually doesn't work and it actually um, can really damage turf grass and other plants. So it's just a bad way to go. Um, sometimes some of these organic um, methods that we think are going to be a little bit gentler and still take care of the problem actually cause a whole other slew of problems. So they're usually, they're not usually, but in this case, it is not the best option to go with something like that. So Creeping Charlie is probably a weed that most of us are familiar with, unfortunately. It is one of those things that if you can just kind of keep a check on it, you'll probably be okay. You don't need to get crazy about it, but I will also say that probably once you have Creeping Charlie, I suspect you probably have at least some of it forever. That's not great news when it comes to weeds, but a rum and tonic helps. All right, cheers you guys. Creeping Charlie, I have it and I have a lot of it. I don't know if I have the wherewithal to deal with that one this year, but, but boy, it stinks too. I hate the smell of Creeping Charlie and it's a creep. <laughs> they name these things so appropriately, I think. Um, but anyway, that's it. I have missed you guys. Thank you guys so much for joining Erin and I for this fun series of wine and weeds. And we hope you have a great weekend. Thanks you guys.